Okay, so I hope that you can see my screen now. Please interrupt me when uh, if something goes wrong with the presentation or so. So uh, my plan today is to give you a very general overview of what uh, quantum espresso is. And uh, I will spend most of the time of my talk then in fact talking about very basic things. Mainly I will talk about the plane wave basis set and what plane waves and periodic system and K points and all these kind of things have to do one with the other. Because these are very recurring themes which uh, also distinguish quantum space from many other electronic structure codes. And I think as a first um, presentation in this conference, this is probably the main topic one, uh, one should mention. As Stefan has just said, we have had many, many kind of schools in the past, but this is really the first one where everything is virtual. And uh, this being virtual, this is really a very large scale collaboration. Um, here I just list uh, the logos of, of kind of sponsors and you see all kind of different institutions. There is uh, the Quantum Espresso Foundation, obviously there's Max, which the, um, Stefano has just introduced. There are also the two Trieste institutions, CISA and ICDP, which is my, my own affiliation. There's SECAM. We have supercomputer centers, Cineca from Italy. There is the Arnes supercomputer center, which is in, in Slovenia. We have Shanghai University. So it's really a, a large scale collaboration by um, many people, just like Quantum Espresso itself is a large scale collaboration of many developers, many interested people and, and so on. So um, this is where I am uh, in this very moment. This is Trieste, the Miramare region. I am sitting right now in an office, which is somewhere here in, uh, in this building. And if there wasn't this horrible pandemic going on, I think it's quite sure to say that um, we all would now be here in that area and sitting somewhere um, close to the seaside and, uh, and talking about physics. But well, uh, we all know that it could not come like this. So um, only I am here now and uh, I'm trying to talk to, to all of you from all kinds of places in the world. So my, let me just say some words about ICTP since this is my, my own institution. So ICTP is, uh, we have just seen where it's located here in uh, Trieste. It is now nearly 60 years of old already and it was founded um, by uh, the um, uh, Nobel um, laureate Abdus Salam. And uh, we are in fact an uh, international organization which is under the two United Nations agencies, which are UNESCO, so the UN Arm for Science, Culture and Education, and the IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency. And we are also um, recognized by the seed agreement with Italy. So our goal in ICDP is to bring together people from kind of from everywhere in the world to do science and work collaboratively um, on scientific problems. Um, we all know that in today's world, uh, more often people do wars against each other than do scientific collaboration. So I think this mission, even now 60 years after the foundation of our center is, is very important. And in a sense, this going virtual, like we are doing now with this uh, school and so on, these virtual ideas um, also are kind of bringing us close to our, um, to this mission of bringing people from the whole world together. This is very well illustrated. If you look at this map of the world where these circles here indicate where people have been applying from. And you see really from every corner of the world, um, we have had applicants. In fact, this activity is a record breaker. Never in the history of ICDP, anything has had 1,292 applicants. So we are very proud of this, obviously this big success and interest which, uh, which Quantum Espresso and which our topics have. Um, I would also like to say what Stefan has already said, we are at the same time very sorry that this 1,292 is about one order of magnitude more than the number of people we could admit. The reason is that this is a hands-on school and we have a limited number of tutors and it's the first time. So we could really admit only ma many, many fewer people than we would have liked to admit. So I would like to say to all those who have not been selected and will perhaps now look at this on uh, YouTube in streaming or watch a recording later, 
Um, it is clearly not due to you that we could not admit it, but it is the logistics and the fact that it's the first time. So um, I would like uh, to go to science and not say many things, but this huge number of applicants and this fact that this is really first for ICDP, this has put a lot of work, especially on the secretaries who had to deal with all these applicants and so on. So I would like just here uh, say a special thank to Monica, Victoria and Adriana who have uh, in a uh, very nice and, and smooth way managed to cope with so many applicants and so much bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic um, issues. Okay. So um, again, okay. so I would now like to come to, to the heart and to the star of this school, which is quantum espresso. So what does this quantum espresso mean? Well, form, so a quantum, everyone knows what it means because we're doing quantum mechanical simulations. And this espresso stands for open source package for electronic, um, sorry, open source package for research in electronic structure, simulation and optimization. Um, this is an acronym which uh, we have been looking a long time until we found something. The real reason is probably that most of the people behind quantum espresso are Italians. So that might be one of the reasons why this is called espresso. The other reason might be that the results you get from these calculations, they are so exciting that uh, it's like an espresso. It keeps you excited and, uh, and, and awake when you use quantum espresso. And um, so quantum espresso, as we talk about it today, exists in fact since 2002. And uh, since this is an activity which uh, we are doing together here with a um, Chinese organization, I would like to um, recall the fact that in fact, in this year, 2002, many of us were sitting in Beijing airport and we were precisely discussing that the set of progs and codes which already existed, but which were did not really have neither a trademark nor a real structuring beneath them, they should come under one umbrella. And it was in fact in Beijing airport that uh, the name Espresso for this whole thing came up. So this is also some connection to China. And so in 2002, this umbrella was kind of created, Quantum Espresso, but some of the core components or the most important components which underlie many of these codes, this goes back, um, more than even 30 years and probably even more than 30 years. Um, but since 2002, there was this um, deliberate effort to try to put subroutines in common between different programs to, to have a common architecture for many things which before were very different. And uh, what distinguishes um, this quantum espresso from many other approaches to, to electronic structure is that we are trying, we are not always managing, but we are trying very much to be at the forefront of theoretical methods. So when someone invents new functionals or a new computational method to calculate something new, very often, rather quickly, these new developments find their way into quantum espresso. And uh, so we are kind of uh, proud of the fact that most of the interesting things today are in fact in one way or another implemented in, uh, in quantum espresso. So one of the two um, goals we have is this um, staying close to innovation. And the other goal is that we are trying to make these codes run on as many different computer architectures as possible. Um, some of you have perhaps already seen this, uh, this video which Nicola Mazzari has once done where he has installed a quantum espresso on a smartphone. It was even a very old smartphone. So basically from smartphones up to mainframe computers, um, clusters, your laptop, you name it. Um, quantum espresso can use and run on many modern architectures, including architectures which are, have accelerators and so on. There will be also some session about um, and GPU and accelerators, in fact, in, in this school. Okay. So these are the kind of the two aspects which uh, I would say distinguish us from any other um, thing. Another thing which is not particular to quantum espresso, but which I find extremely important, is that this code is a free code. Okay. So everything in quantum espresso is distributed under this uh, GNU um, public license. And uh, this means that anyone who wants has access 
to the source code, but not only has access to and can read it, um, but can also distribute the code however um, someone wants. So if you take Quantum Espresso and you find someone who is even willing to pay you money for giving it, you can even sell the code if you want. It's completely free. The only thing is that uh, the, this license requires that if you have some derivative work related on it, you are asked also to, to publish this under the similar kind of license. And um, this kind of free um, nature of our codes, it not only means that everyone can use the code, even if people working in some research groups which perhaps do not have the money to pay licenses or so on, but it also means that people who perhaps uh, like programming or like new methods, they have a very low um, hurdle to overcome to implement their ideas in our codes. This is probably also one. So I think this free license is also one of the reasons why we are able to, um, to stay, as I said, in the forefront of new developments and having all the time new developers which are joining our team. Obviously, I mean, uh, this free license is not uh, singular to Quantum Express. So I mean, the most famous one is the Linux kernel, which is in this very moment running on most of your computers. So. So another thing which uh, I should say in the beginning is if you're really a beginner and you wonder where can I get more help or where can I get answers to my question and where can I get information from, there are various sources which you can look at. Well, one is obviously a school like this one. You can look at this school and you could, can also look at recordings of previous schools where many things are explained. But apart from this, one of the um, thing is obviously the, the main, the official documenting papers. Here are these two papers from 2009 and 2017. And in fact, we are very happy if people who have some results publish some results with our codes, if they, publish, if they cite um, these, uh, these papers. Another very rich source of information is obviously our website, quantumespresso.org. On that website, you can find links to the code itself, you can find links to pseudo potentials to various um, places where pseudo potentials um, um, can come from. You can find links to mailing lists. So there, this is kind of probably the first place to start looking for information is this Quantum Espresso website. Now this week, all of you will be working with the code itself installed in a computer. And as soon as you install Quantum Espresso on your computer, you will have, um, all the, the source code, obviously, but also the source code contains this documentation, these stock subdirectories, and they contain a lot of um, input explanation and, and, and files which explain you how you can address certain problems. If you're more not so much into user, but into a developer's one, then you might be interested in the GitHub, obviously, where uh, Quantum Espresso is hosted. And then if you run Quantum Espresso and uh, something stops with some cryptic error message, which we really don't know what it means, one good thing is always to look in the archive of the mailing lists. So put the copy, the, your, the strange error message in Google or so, you will very likely end up on these mailing lists, which I um, recommend you to subscribe. And if you do not find in the archive of the mailing list the answer to your problems, then you can obviously also write to the mailing list. And uh, there are many people who try to, to help with these issues. So there are many ways how you can get help. And you, or, I mean, if you're lucky and you know some of the peepers, people and tutors of the next two weeks, you may also contact one of these people and, and directly, obviously. Then I should a bit say what Quantum Espresso itself is. So quantum espresso, in fact, is not one code. Okay, so you cannot go on a computer and say um, run the executable quantum espresso. In fact, this does not exist. There is no executable quantum espresso. Quantum espresso is kind of, as I said before, a package. It's a package which contains various other codes, many other codes, as you will see in a second. And um, but these packages kind of they rely on two packages which are the core of everything and also kind of the oldest one. One is the PW program, it's PW.x is the executable. We call it PWSCF. It stands for plane wave self-consistent field. This is the main workhorse for calculating the electronic structure in a self-consistent way. You can do structural optimizations of your system. You can use variable cells. 
PWSEF can also do molecular dynamics to some degrees, but it's really not optimized for being very fast in molecular, molecular dynamics. For molecular dynamics, instead, there is this second basic code, which is the CP code, the Kappa um, Arinello molecular dynamics. And as the name indicates, uh, the CP code, this is really geared to do it um, ab initio molecular dynamics. And it can also do variable cell molecular dynamics. So these are the two basic codes. And it's um, very likely that for running any of the other codes or for using any of the other codes, you would probably first have to run either PWSCF or uh, CP in order to get the basic results on which then the other codes rely. So here I just made a list and I'm sure I might have uh, forgotten some. So the most important kind of other codes which are part of this, this distribution. So on one hand, the phonon code, it's also one of the oldest uh, codes which uh, um, of the package. This implements linear response calculations, so density functional response theory. And with this code, one can calculate phonons in the system and dielectric properties. And uh, so this is a typical thing you have to calculate in a system phonons. One first has always to calculate with PWSF, the ground state electronic structure of a system. And then kind of as a second step, one can run phonon or one of the other codes then to calculate in this case, the phonons. Another big part of uh, the things are the PP um, and programs. PP stands for post-processing. And this allows you to analyze results. You can look at what is the density of states? How do the cone sham orbitals look like? What is uh, the electrostatic potential in your system? Things like this. So the PP programs allow you to examine and analyze results of, for example, PWSCF. Um, needless to say that during these two weeks, you will get in touch with all of, uh, with most of these codes, but certainly you will get in touch with phone and, and the PP codes. Another very um, popular code is uh, the NEB code, which uh, allows you to um, calculate um, reaction pathways, transition states, and so on, reaction barriers. So this is a driver co code, which inside itself runs PW. Then we have um, uh, the atomic suite of programs. So with the atomic code, one can create pseudopotentials, which I will talk about a bit later today also, what might be pseudopotential and So we have a code which is running for any given atom of the periodic table. You calculate the all electron atomic wave functions, and then you can create pseudopotentials. There is a GUI program also, which is a graphical user interface. There's a code uh, PWCONT for calculating conductance. You can calculate X-ray absorption spectra with the X spectra code. Um, one can go beyond ground state electronic structure by doing either GW calculations, so many body perturbation theory. And we have one implementation of it, which uh, uses localized Vanier function. This is the GWL code. There is TDDFT implemented, uh, so time dependent uh, density functional um, theory. Um, this is also a code which can be used for calculating electronic excited states. Something which in recent years has become extremely popular in the scientific community is electron phonon effects. So there is a code which is called EPW, electron phonon um, physics. This code obviously like the other one is linked to the phonon code, which is linked to PW. So you see that there's also a hierarchy always of these different codes. And there's a code HP, which allows one to calculate some Hubbard parameters in certain systems. I'm sure that there are many more and other codes, but I think these are the most important. So you see this quantum espresso is not one code, but it's a whole distribution of different codes, which have a hierarchy because some of them need the output of one code in order to be run and to be analyzed. Okay. So this is kind of what quantum espresso is really all about. And uh, what is underlying everything is obviously the big theory is density function theory. Okay. So um, in this talk, it's just one talk today, I will not be able to, to give a full introduction into density function theory and explain where everything comes from. What I would like to do in the next minutes is rather than really giving a full introduction to DFT, I will introduce the most important notation and just say the most important things hoping that all of you have in one way or the other already encountered density function theory. So in DFT, so it's a ground state theory, we are interested in a system which has N electrons. 
Each electron has obviously a spin one half. And these n electrons are somehow distributed in space and give rise to an electron density. Now, the electron density is a very easy quantity because the electron density is simply a scalar function at each point in space. It's always non negative. And the integral over all space of this density must correspond to the number of electrons you have in it. So, the density, which is kind of our basic variable in DFT, is a very easy quantity and surely much easier quantity than, say, the ground state many body wave function of your system. Now, in DFT, what we know, thanks to Hohenberg and Cohn and the Hohenberg and Cohn theorem, is that there exists a functional, so a function of a function, which takes as an input this ground state electron density and gives you the ground state um, energy of your system. So this DFT functional is unknown, but one knows in a, in a mathematical proven way that this functional um, exists. Okay. So the way how one addresses then this problem is typically going to the Kohn-Sham formalism. And in the Kohn-Sham formalism, this unknown functional of, of DFT is written as the sum of several terms. One is a kinetic energy term, this Ts, which you see here, then an external energy term, the Hartree energy term, um, exchange correlation energy, all these depend on the density, and then the trivial ionic ionic interaction, which is just the Coulomb interaction between. So this here should give you the ground state energy of a system with charge density n. And you see, however, that uh, Kohn and Sham, they had to introduce, in order to get a good approximation for the kinetic energy, they have introduced here orbitals. So not many body wave functions, but single particle orbitals, the so-called Kohn Sham orbitals. And these orbitals, they are linked to the charge density just in the way as one would guess. So they are n orthonormal orbitals, and the sum of their square moduli, this is the famous charge density. They have introduced these orthonormal Kohn Sham orbitals in order to have a good approximation for the kinetic energy. So, this Kohn Sham um, non interacting particle kinetic energy is written in the following way. So it's again a sum over all these n Kohn Sham orbitals, and then the, the usual expression one would write for a kinetic energy. Okay? And these orbitals, obviously, they are n and uh, they are orthonormal. Um, this is obviously not the exact kinetic energy of a many body system, it's an approximation. This is why it's a T, but it's Ts, the single particle uh, kinetic energy. And all which we do not know about this functional, in fact, is written, is, is hidden here in this exchange correlation functional. All the other energies, in fact, we can write them down explicitly. So the external energy, so external means coming from the ions. It's simply the external potential, which is the Coulomb potential due to the atomic nuclei, which are positively charged, exerting on the, on the electrons. So this here is simply the density times the given external potential. The Hartree potential is also very easy to write down knowing the density because it's simply the classical Coulomb interaction of charges. So written here in this way, ions, as I've said, is simply the pointwise interaction between the, the ions of your system. The big unknown in DFT and the problem where kind of the failures of DFT come in is that no one knows the exact form of exchange and correlation. So this exchange correlation functional must be approximated. And there are many, many various approximations. None of them is perfect. I will in this talk not talk at all about exchange correlation functionals, but the usual ones, which uh, either simply are simply local approximation in terms of N or semi-local, or then also more complex stuff, um, are implemented in fact in quantum espresso. So for the moment here, just take for granted that some approximation of the unknown energy here, the exchange correlation, is, is given, and we take that in our code. So this gives us now a way of writing the ground state um, density of our system in terms of, say, either density or these orthonormal Kohn-Sham orbitals. So in practice, what is done, what is always done is one wants to find the ground state energy. So one is minimizing this quantity with respect to the density, or if you want, with respect to the Kohn-Sham orbitals. And if you write down, in fact, the functional derivative of uh, the DFT energy with respect to the Kohn-Sham orbitals, and you add the um, constraint that these orbitals must remain always orthonormal, 
Then one ends up with an equation which looks like this. These are the famous cohn sham equations, and they look like a Schrödinger equation. Okay? So the cohn sham equations are essentially a Hamiltonian-like operator acting on each one of these single particle cohn sham orbitals equals energy times this. So a Schrödinger-like equation. And this cohn sham Hamiltonian, which, you, which we have here, contains, in fact, the derivatives of the energies we have seen before. Kinetic part, which is simply the derivative um, of uh, the kinetic energy of the previous slide, the external potential, which is due to the nuclei, the Hartree potential, and exchange correlation potential. And the formal definition is that the exchange correlation potential is the functional derivative of this unknown exchange correlation function with respect to the density. Same for Hartree, it's the functional derivative of the Hartree energy, which uh, we know explicitly, and therefore it has this easy form. And um, <clears throat> so one can solve this equation. So you have a Schrödinger equation. It has eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, and if you solve this, say with the, some either iterative or with a complete solver, you will find these eigenenergies epsilon. Okay? So if you plot then these eigenenergies epsilon, you have one eigenvalue, another one, another one, um, from bottom to top, you might have something like this. And if you have n electrons, you will need n such eigenvalues and, uh, and eigenfunctions. So what one is doing is one is filling up the lowest n levels just here, if the system is non-magnetic in the way which I've shown here. Um, and uh, um, one does not even need to calculate, one can calculate if one wants more of these empty states here, of the empty eigen um, vectors of your Hamiltonian but it's not necessary to calculate them. You must calculate at least as many as you have electrons. Or, I mean, always a factor of two for spin, if your system, depending if your system is magnetic or if it is not magnetic. So in practice, what one is doing is one has a, a Hamiltonian. That Hamiltonian is well-defined once you know a density and once you know, um, have an approximation for exchange and correlation. One calculates in one way or the other, we will talk about it in a minute, eigenvalues of this, and one takes the lowest eigenvalues and takes as the Kuhn-Sham orbitals, those functions which correspond to these low-lying eigenvectors. Okay, so this, it seems to be very straightforward and very easy, but there is one problem in this. And the problem is that this Hamiltonian here itself, it depends on the charge density. You can see it very clearly, for example, the Hartree potential here in order to calculate it, you need to know what is the density. But the density, you obtain it from the Kuhn-Sham orbitals, so from the solution of this Schrödinger equation. So the problem which arises here is that you have an equation. In order to write down the equation, you need to know already its solution. You need to know the Kuhn-Sham orbitals in order to be able to write the equation which the Kuhn-Sham orbitals have to satisfy. So you see, it's kind of a circular problem. And this is well known as the consistency or the self-consistency problem. We must be able somehow to find Kuhn-Sham orbitals, which are eigenfunctions of an operator, where inside the operator, the, the, the operators in here are defined by n, and n, as you remember from the previous slide, for n, we need to know what are the Kuhn-Sham orbitals, okay? So, this self-consistency problem, there are various ways how one can try to, to address this. And the way which is implemented in the PWSEF code and um, also in many other codes is to do this in an iterative way. Let me show so kind of uh, the picture how, how one can imagine this iterative way. So this is known as a, a self-consistency um, circle. And the idea is, in the beginning, obviously, you do not know yet anything, okay? So in the beginning, you have to guess somehow what the density might look like. And you can guess whatever you want. You can start with a guess, say, put as a density simply random numbers. Or you can put, which is most of the time done, you can put as a guess in the beginning, um, a density which would just be the superposition of unperturbed atoms which do not interact. The only thing is that your starting density, it must satisfy obviously these two rules. It must be non-negative and it's integral 
must be uh, correspond to the number of electrons you have in your system. Okay, so you guess anything. You call this density, which you have guessed, the um, at the the density at iteration zero. Okay, so now you have a density. It is certainly a wrong density, but um, it's an admissible density from the mathematical point of view. And with this density, you can now build this Hamiltonian from the previous slide. Huh? So you can go here now having some density you can write what is the Hartree potential what is the exchange correlation potential so, so now you can define this Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian obviously it will be as wrong as the density will be wrong this Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian will probably not be the one which we will have in the end but you now have a Hamiltonian at iteration number i in this case in the beginning at the zero iteration now with this Hamiltonian you can now solve this Schrödinger-like equation, which I've shown you. So you have h times psi is epsilon psi, and you obtain, I have written here out, the output of this um, Schrödinger-like equation, you get energies and orbitals. Hmm. Now you can take these output orbitals, take the square moduli of these orbitals, this gives you a new density, the output density. So you started with the guest density to the left, and you end up with an output density of your system, which is of these new eigenfunctions of your Hamilton. And now you look at it. If you're in the first iteration, for sure, this output density here will be different from what you have guessed in the beginning. So you're comparing them. Are they more or less the same? And there is some, some criterion, some convergence criterion. In the beginning, certainly the answer is no, they are not nearly the same. And you go to the next step. So what you're doing now is you're taking these two densities, the one which you have guessed before and the output density which you have just calculated, and you're mixing them together. In the easiest way, in the easiest case, you're just mixing as I've written here. You take a parameter alpha, which is a number between zero and one. And you are taking a bit of the old density and the other bit of the new density. You're mixing them together. Now, this mixing is important in order to have this um, repetitive circle to be able to converge. If you do not mix and just take the output and put it as a new input, it's very likely that you will have um, oscillations going on forever. So this mixing is necessary for assuring convergence and for um, a kind of, is, you can see it as if you were adding some kind of friction into your system. So you now obtain a new density, I call them i plus one of iteration i plus one. This new density is now different from the one we have guessed in the very beginning. Now you set the variable i to the next one. So you have the next iteration, you use it again to build a Kohn-Sham Hamiltonian, you solve uh, the Schrodinger equation, you get again a new density. And again, you are comparing, is what I plug it in more or less the same as what I get here and you, iterate this as a function of how your system is. You might need five iterations, you might need 10. Sometimes one needs 200 iterations, it depends. And obviously there are many parameters in PW input files, which you can tune to try to get better convergence on this side. But um, the basic idea here is always this here. You, you start with some guess, you build uh, the Hamiltonian, you solve the contrary you get new density, and you do this with the mixing. And finally, the so-called self-consistency is reached if the density you use to build your Hamiltonian is the same as the one which comes out of the eigenfunction of that same Hamiltonian. In this case, you are done and you have found the ground state density of your system. Okay? So this is in, in theory, in two, three pictures, how um, the self-consistent circle looks like. In practice, since this is a hands-on school, you will see, all see it starting from uh, um, later this morning. This is a part of an output of uh, quantum espresso. And what you see here in the output is, it says in the very beginning, my initial potential, so the initial Hamiltonian is guessed from a superposition of three atoms in this case, okay? So here it takes atoms, and this is just taken as initial guess. As I've said, it could even be random numbers, but here the code has used as an initial guess a superposition of three atoms. It also needs to start with um, some, uh, some guess for these um, Kohn-Sham um, orbitals. And here it takes atomic orbitals, 
but it is randomized. And so it's adding a little bit of random numbers to them to break some spurious symmetries which might be there. So this is what the code is doing in the beginning. It is guessing how the solutions might look like. And then it starts iterating as I just said. It says iteration one, it gets a guess for the energy which certainly is very bad. And it says, ah, but I, I see that the accuracy here in this case is it's still very poor. It does the next iteration, has a better guess for the energy, and you see that the estimated accuracy is going down. That's the third iteration, and so on, and it will continue. In this case, you see until iteration 10 and iteration 11, and then you see here after iteration 11, obviously this accuracy, you see it has been going down from 1.9 in the first step, this is if you want the comparison between the two densities up to here already 10 to the minus uh, eight or something like this. And then at a certain point it reaches its convergence threshold here. This is after iteration 11. And in this case now the code prints out of this self consistent Hamiltonian, which are the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues remember these lines where you put two electrons starting from the bottom. These here are the eigen energies in electron volts of your Hamiltonian in increasing order. And it also tells you, ah, okay, so in this case, the highest occupied level is minus 6.2. So this here is the highest occupied level. And the first level, which I did not occupy anymore, is minus one. So you see here, and it has, in this case here, um, if you want a band gap of about five electron volts. Okay, so this is what the code does. Then it gives you the total energy at this one. And you see now this accuracy, this conversion threshold, it's really very small now. And this is why it is said, okay, we have converged. In this case, it needed 11 iterations. So this is the basic thing. Whenever you run PW, so the basic DFT code of quantum espresso, you will always notice this. It starts with some guess. It does a series of iterations. Hopefully at a certain point it converges. When it is converged, it gives you the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian and the energy. Okay. Unfortunately, I have, when I was um, copying this picture here into my presentation, I, cut, I was by mistake cutting here the left because once it is converged, it is putting the code, it's putting an exclamation mark in front of the converged total energy. So you can, if you use a grab of an exclamation mark in the output, you directly find the converged total energy. So unfortunately, I have cut this away without walking. Okay. So this is what I've said. Now, as we know how in principle a ground state DFT calculation can be done, we have to ask ourselves, well, how is this done in practice? Because we have densities, we have Kronchamm orbitals, they are all functions of R of space, and this must be stored in a computer somehow. A computer cannot store a function. A computer can only store numbers, a set of numbers. So any electronic structure code, not only quantum structures, any code will need a basis set. A basis set essentially is a, a set of functions. Here I call the functions B alpha, a set of functions. And whatever you are interested in, being the density, being it a cone sham order or whatever, is expressed as a linear combination of some given basis functions. Okay? And which function you use as basis functions, this is kind of determining also which code you're using, because typically you cannot within one code change. Okay? So there are various functions which you can use to express your density and your objects as linear combinations. And um, so here again, I say this. So the function which you need to represent in the computer is this f. You have given, before you start your calculations, a, a set of basis functions. We'll talk about them in a minute, what they are. What the computer really stores is only these expansion coefficients. Okay. So for every function it needs to represent, it is storing the expansion coefficient for every uh, basis function it has. This is in the computer's memory. Now, how many basis functions are there? I called here this number m, and this is the size of the basis set. And you can already imagine that if you have a basis set which is larger, then you will need much more memory in your computer because for every function, you need to store these m expansion coefficients. So on one hand, you would like m to be as small as possible in order to save memory. 
But on the other hand, you also want your basis set as complete as possible in order to be able to describe any shape of your function as a linear combination of your basis set. So many various basis sets can be chosen. Very popular are, for example, basis sets which are localized around uh, given atoms. Huh? Um, or for example, Gaussian functions, which are centered on your atom or atomic orbitals, which are also centered on the atoms. But none of this is done in quantum espresso. One of the defining features of quantum espresso is that we are using plane waves as basis sets. So these functions, V alpha, which are used in the quantum espresso codes are plane waves. What do you mean with plane waves? Well, here you see it explicitly. A plane wave is essentially e to the i, a wave vector times r. You can, so essentially, in other words, a plane wave is a sine and a cosine function, okay? With a given well-defined wave vector. And once you have defined the wave vector, you know what this plane wave is, okay? So in quantum express, so everything, densities, contram orbitals, and what you have is expressed as linear combinations of sine and cosine functions. And, um, this has obviously important consequences. So why are we using these plane waves and not something which is localized on, on, on your atoms? Well, because the plane waves have a lot of advantages. So one thing is obviously they are very easy functions. So everyone can very easily integrate or take a derivative of a plane wave. So there are many, many expressions which appear in your equations are very easy to perform. The other thing is if you have two plane waves with two different wave vectors, then automatically they are orthogonal and two plane waves with the same wave vector, they are, um, they are uh, normalized. So plane wave is automatically a, an orthonormal basis set, which is also very useful in practice. Um, the other advantage is that plane waves are unbiased in the sense that you have a system, you throw plane waves on it and you do therefore not assume, ah, all my electrons are close to the transition metals or all my electrons are close to the center of my molecule or something. No, you do not assume anything. Every point in space is treated equally in the same way and there is no bias in, in, in this. Another point is that since the plane waves are independent of where your atoms are sitting, you do not have a change of basis set whenever you move your atoms. So if you do some molecular dynamics or so, your atoms move, but your basis set remains the same. The basis set does not change with changing atoms, which is the case if you have, for example, atomic orbitals centered on your atoms. You move around an atom, you move the basis set, and therefore you have different basis sets for different geometries. And that means in practice that you have forces to calculate so-called Poole forces, and they are absent in, in codes which use plane wave. Another very big advantage is the convergence of the basis set size. This is something I uh, will be talking about in the following um, slides a lot. So the, there is one number which you can increase or decrease, and with this number make the your calculation or your basis set better or less good and you can very easily in this way check on the conversions of your basis set so it's really useful to have just one number which you you, you change and the other point is that obviously um plane waves and sine and cosine they are ideal for using fourier transforms and going back and forth and solving poisson equations and things like that obviously i mean the big disadvantage is that since plane waves have no build in knowledge about what chemistry looks, looks like, what an atomic function looks normally like. Typically, these spaces are much, much bigger. So this number M, the basis size is much larger than if you use atomic orbitals or if you use Gaussian or something like this. Okay. So now that we have established how we express our um, functions using kind of combinations of functions, which look like what you see here, I have to talk about something which is intrinsic whenever you talk about um, um, plane waves. And this is periodicity. We will see in a minute later why, that why it is so important that, um, or why periodicity of a system is so closely linked to, um, um, to the use of plane waves. But um, so for this reason, let, let me just say some more words. So imagine you know that a system is periodic. Here, I just show it in, in two dimensions. So periodic means that 
you have a unit cell which is repeated indefinitely in all three dimensions. So here for showing this, it's just a two dimensional world. So once you define your basic box and the box does not need to be a rectangular box as I've shown here, I've shown here kind of a hexagonal box. So um, in this case, it's made out of two vectors. One of the two vectors of, of, of this box would be this one, the other this one. And this is the basic cell, which in a periodic system you imagine repeated indefinitely. Together with your basic repeating box, you define where the atoms are. So in this case, for example, I decide I put in every box two atoms, one at the origin. And you see, it's not even necessary that they lie directly the atoms inside the box, which you define, which defines your periodicity. You can put them anywhere, but you will repeat the atoms as you will repeat the box. So now looking at this, probably it's not easy by the eye to see what kind of system you are calculating with this kind of box, these kind of two atoms. But if you are instead of plotting just one unit, plot now a two by two repetition of it, you see, ah, okay, this already looks like here something which is a cyclic, okay. Huh? And if instead of two, I plot three, you can see that we are coming closer and closer to, uh, to the hexagonal uh, graphene structure. And in fact, if you imagine that you would be having really an infinite repetition of this box with two atoms, you see that this gives you, in this case, a sheet of graphene. Obviously, I've chosen this example because in the, in the exercises today, graphene will be one of the first exercises you will be capable. Okay. So periodic systems can either be, typically they are three dimension. Here I've chosen a two dimensional um, system, but if you have a crystal, for example, you have a diamond or something like that, this is what happens typically with a three dimensional box with three lattice vectors and you repeat it indefinitely. And inside this box, you have your atoms at well-defined positions, okay? So imagine you have a system which is periodic and uh, you now would like to describe wave functions using plane waves in such a periodic setup. Now, one thing you, which you probably remember from mathematics, if you have a function which is periodic in real space. So you have anything, for example, a density, which is the same in this box as it is in this box as in this box. So you have um, something which in real space is periodic. You calculate the Fourier transform and you will find out that the Fourier components are nearly all zero, except for the, um, the Fourier components at very special discrete wave vectors G. And in fact, so in one dimension, where you can see it very easily, if your plane wave looks like e to the i g x, so just a one dimensional thing, you will have non zero expansion coefficients only in front of those plane waves where this g vector satisfies the fact that it must be an integer number times 2 pi over L. So L in this case is in one dimension the size of the repeated unit. And uh, this two pi over L, if you want, is the distance between non-zero um, Fourier components. Or in other ways, while originally you have had um, um, an infinite number of plane waves, now you still have an, um, an infinite number of um, basis functions, but now you have not a continuous, but you have discrete values of G, which you have to consider. This is thanks to the periodicity of your system. In three dimension, it's very similar. You have a three dimensional wave vector, and the wave vector of three dimension must be an integer multiple, m, n, and p are integers, an integer multiple of the three reciprocal lattice vectors. Okay, so also here you have now discrete um, plane waves rather than a continuous set of wave vectors in your basis set. In 1D, you can see it again here. So you have the possible non-zero G vectors are, well, obviously G equals zero. And then you have one, two, three, four, and so on, times the basic two pi over L, which is the distance here. And you can already see that the larger your unit cell, so if you double your unit cell, L becomes larger. And this distance between the discrete point becomes smaller. If you double the size of your unit cell, you will have double the density of G vectors um, in, your, in your basis. Okay. Now, a wave vector is always linked, obviously, to a wavelength. 
And if you plot the wavelength, or if in the same thing, you look at what is the wavelength of all these wave vectors here. So you have um, the wavelength here, you have lambda is equal to the size of your box, then uh, the size divided by two, three, four, and so on. Okay? So the wavelength which you're describing with a given plane wave is inversely proportional to the G vector. So now, thanks to the fact that we live in a periodic world, we now can say, okay, instead of having an infinite number of basis vectors because G is continuous, we now still have an infinite number, but now we have discrete values for G. Okay? And the, the values are these here. But still, in order to do a practical calculation, we need a finite number of basis functions. So somehow we need to take out of this infinity of possible plane waves, we need to take only some. And this is done by imposing, in fact, a minimal size of features you want to be able to describe in your system. Okay? So one is saying, okay, I know that my density or my orbitals, they will not vary on the scale of, of the atomic nucleus. They will vary on the scale of, I don't know, perhaps half or a tenth of an angstrom or something like this. So we define, and this is the one parameter which defines our basis, that we define a minimal wavelength which we want to be able to describe. And this I show you here. So this is again my G vectors, my discrete G vectors. And now I define a minimal wavelength lambda min. And you see here, for example, if I say lambda min is this value here, then L over four is still a wavelength which is um, larger than the minimum you have imposed. But here then lambda L divided by five, six, and so on. This is a smaller wavelength. And here, the same is for the minus g's here. You have, again, the same thing. So imposing a minimal wavelength, which you want to be able to describe, kind of cuts out of this discrete but infinite number of possible plane waves, all those out which are lying to the left or to the right of your cutoff wavelength. Okay? So this is basically the idea in one dimension. You have one parameter which describes how good your basis set is. And this is obviously something system dependent, and it's this minimum wavelength lambda min. So for, for practical reasons, one is typically in an input file hoop, sorry, not describing what is lambda min, but one is describing um, what is the maximal norm of the G vector which comes in. And in fact, so the maximal value of the G vector obviously is inversely proportional to this lambda min. So it's the same if you describe a minimum wavelength or a maximum norm of the G vector. And in fact, what really one puts into quantum espresso in the code is a cut of energy, which would correspond to the kinetic energy of that maximal G vector. So in a PW input file, you will put in E cut. The E cut defines by via this equation, a maximum norm of the G vectors, and therefore a, a minimal feature size, which in your system you would like to describe. So if you're not in one dimension, but in two or three dimension, it looks a little bit like this. The G vectors, as I said, are integers times the, the reciprocal lattice vector. So here, let reciprocal lattice vector one would be in this direction, reciprocal lattice vector two would be this vector here. And then you have integer numbers times this. So you have a discrete set of possible G vectors, which are compatible with a periodic system, a discrete set of G vectors, but an infinite number. Now you impose a, a maximum um, um, kinetic energy, or if you want a minimal feature size, you would like to be able to describe. This defines you a, a, a norm, G max. Okay? Um, this looks in two dimensions now like a circle. In one dimension, it was the two blue lines I've shown in the previous slide. In two dimension, it's this circle. In three dimension, it would be a sphere of this radius of G max, which is related to the kinetic to the to the cutoff energy okay so you have this and now you consider only those plane waves which have a norm which is inferior than your cutoff and now you are left up with the basis set which is well defined because it is a finite number of g vectors and these are they okay so this is how in quantum espresso you obtain um, a basis set it is by imposing a, a minimal feature size or a cutoff energy which um, um, cuts the total number of possible G vectors to finite number. Okay, so now I need to say something about 
orbitals and charge density. So what we have done now is we are saying, okay, we have a function which is periodic, for example, a cone charm orbital, psi L. This cone charm orbital is written, as we have said, as a linear combination of these basis functions. The sum goes only over these allowed G vectors, which lie inside our sphere, okay? And what the computer stores for every plane wave is this expansion coefficient here. This is what is stored in the computer. So imagine we are doing this with a well-defined cutoff with a well-defined G max for the Kronschaum orbitals. Then the next step, which we would need to do is to calculate the charge density corresponding to those Kronschaum orbitals. Remember that the charge density is calculating by calculating the square modulus of the orbitals. Now, if you see this here, this is in real space, a product of two functions. Fourier analysis tells you if you have in real space, a product of two functions, this corresponds in reciprocal space to a convolution. So if I write this down here, the, what is the Fourier transform of the density? So this is now a function of G, okay? Then I obtain here again, a sum over all possible vectors because this here will also be periodic. So I have again, um, a sum over G primes. And I have something like this, psi of G and psi of G minus G prime. Now I know that this term here, the psi tilde of G prime will be non-zero only if G prime lies inside my sphere because this is precisely how I've defined it, okay? So we can restrict the sum over G prime to those lying inside the sphere. But now you see what happens. The vector G, in fact, it can have a norm which is larger than the, nor the maximum norm allowed for the wave function. Because even if say this G here has a norm two times the maximum G, then if G prime is G max, you still can have here a non-zero element. So Fourier analysis tells you that the density, because it is a product of two functions which are written with the cutoff G max, the density will have much higher cutoff. In fact, it will have Fourier components which are non-zero up to two times G max. Okay, so now this is very important um, that in uh, these calculations, you need two different basis sets. One basis set for the orbitals with a given cutoff n of u, and one basis set for the density, which will contain many more G vectors, simply because you have two times G max here, and you therefore need for the density a cutoff, which is at least four times the cutoff for the density, four times because G squared goes into the energy. Okay? So this is, uh, in fact, the reason why you will have always two cutoffs. And if you do not do this, then you get so-called aliasing or aliasing errors in, uh, in your Fourier analysis. And this is nothing you would, you would like to have in your code. Okay? So at this stage, we can say, okay, due to the properties of plane waves, the cutoff for the density must be four times the cutoff of the wave function. Later, um, towards the end of my talk, you will see that sometimes one needs even a higher cutoff for the density, okay? So this is how it looks in PW. This is uh, an absolutely minimal input file here. And the minimal input file tells you, okay, here I use for the wave function, E cut W of C, a cutoff energy of 60. The code reads this. Oh, why that? This is continue. The code reads this and in the output of the code it says, ah, okay, my kinetic energy is 60 Rydbergs as written in the input. For the charge density, I will use four times like it. So obviously the code knows about these Fourier analysis features, okay? So 60, four times gives you this here in the output. Let me just say one thing which you might uh, observe is if you are changing the, the lattice constant of your periodic system, then sometimes you might observe something which is happening here. A strange discontinuity when you are increasing the lattice size of your system. So how can it be that one would expect that functions kind of behave in a continuous way, but sometimes you see discontinuous jumps of the energy. The reason for this is, as you increase the lattice constant of your system, you are making this grid of G vectors denser and denser. Remember that the distance between adjacent points is two pi divided by the size of your system. So increasing the lattice constant here to the left gets these dots closer and closer and closer. You keep a fixed 
cut off energy, obviously, and then at discrete intervals, some points will fall within the sphere and duck. you have in a non-continuous way, you will have a larger basis set. And the larger basis set, if you're not at convergence, means that, um, that the energy goes down. So these jumps, and they are obviously not very pleasant, especially if you are trying to do molecular dynamics where the vari with the variable cell, where the cell size can change. And uh, this problem has, uh, has obviously some solutions. I will not explain them in detail here, but if you're interested in this, look in the input descriptions for the variables EC fix, Q cut C and Q2 sigma. You will have in the input file to set variables like this to take care of eventual um, jumps in the, in the energy when you change the lattice constant of your system. This was just some comment I wanted to make here. Now, very important is something I have not mentioned yet, is the fact that even if your system is periodic, your orbitals typically are not periodic. In fact, we all have learned in solid state physics blocks theorem, okay, which tells us that in fact, the cone charm orbitals in a periodic system, okay, they have a label, a K label, a wave vector label, and they have the shape of E to the I K. So here you see again, a plane wave with a wave vector K, multiplied by a function u. And in fact, only this function u here is periodic. The psi, is, you see this here, k is not necessarily one of these points on our grid. And the psi function itself is not periodic, only this part here. So what does this mean for what I've just been saying up to now? If u is a periodic function, then u we can express on this grid of g vectors I've just been saying before. So u we can express in our basis set with a discrete um, grid of G vectors, just like we have been saying so far. Now you put this U into the definition of a block vector and you obtain something like this. And now you see that you have again an expansion in the terms of discrete set of G vectors, but the effective G uh, um, wave vector is no longer G, but is always K plus G for a Bloch orbital with a wave vector k. Okay, so you have this thing which is shifted by k. In other images, so this is the image we have seen before, is where, where we did not have any, any k point. Now, if instead of g, you have k plus g, you can imagine that this is always shifted away from um, this grid from what it was before. The cutoff remains obviously the same. It's a sphere centered around zero. And the k vector for a given block orbit in effect would be here, this small vector here, this would be k. Another k vector would mean this. So a, a, a block function or a wave vector k here has a basis set given by, by plane waves, which is given by these functions inside this circle. Okay? So for different k vectors, you will have a different three-dimensional grid of allowed g vectors. It is very clear that if you take, um, as if you add to a, um, any k vector a reciprocal lattice vector, then you are shifting this already periodic set of black points so far that you cannot distinguish it anymore. So this kind of explains again to you why in fact um, the system is periodic in k space and one needs to consider in fact only what for, for k, what is happening inside the first brillion zone because anything outside the K vector, outside the first Brillion zone, corresponds by periodicity to a point inside the first Brillion zone. So if you have your periodic system, you have to sum over all possible K vectors, but the K vectors are restricted to lie inside this first Brillion zone. And uh, this is done in quantum espresso quite easily. If here again, I show you a picture of the Brillion zone. So imagine this here is reciprocal lattice vector one, reciprocal lattice vector two, the brilliant zone in this case, if they are rectangular, it will look something like this. And in quantum express, you give in the input file, you say, I want to sample the brilliant zone so in this case, for example, with the four times four K point grid, and then it would choose these K points. And each one of these K points corresponds to what we have seen here before to this shift here of the K plus K. Now, very often it is not useful to take a, a, a grid in K points like this, but one is shifting the K point grid by 
half the distance between these k points. So if I do this, this here would be the shifted four by four grid. So you see, I'm shifting the same grid and I'm just shifting it by half the distance between all these points. Why is it useful to shift your k-point grid? Well, because of symmetry. You see, for example, so if you have a symmetric system where, for example, this wedge here of the brilliant zone would be equivalent to the upper wedge here, then this point here has in the brilliant zone eight friends. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There are eight points which are equivalent. So in order to have calculate the charge density for these eight points, you just need to calculate at one single point. If you have the much more symmetric non-shifted grid, you have no single K point which corresponds to eight other points. You can see this both in, in the non-shifted grid, you always have the K equals zero point. And whatever is the symmetry of, 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 uh, of your system, the, the zero point, it will always end up on itself again. So here symmetry is really a handicap and shifting the K points, in fact, leads to grids with uh, the same amount of calculations, uh, give you a much faster convergence. So in a PW input file, this brilliant zone sampling is done just by saying, okay, I want K points. I want an automatic grid. And in this case, for example, you can say, okay, I want in the X and Y direction, nine points in the C direction, only one. This might be, for example, if you have a two dimensional system like graphene, and then the next three numbers is always zero or one. It tells you for X, Y, and C, if the grid is shifted or not. So the nine, nine, one, 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 zero selection would be a nine times nine grid in two dimensions, which is shifted. And a non-shifted single point, typically the K equals KC equals zero point in the third dimension. And in the output of Platon Espresso, where it gives you the K points it's using, it gives you, ah, okay. This here leads now in this case to 25 non-equivalent K points. And you see every K point, these K points have different weights. This is what I've said here, for example, here these points which have a, a multiplicity, multiplicity of eight, one will calculate them only once, but give them a higher weight. And you see here, there are some points which have a high weight of 0 0.09. Other K points have a much lower weight, like here, like this, the last one, which is 0 0.02. And you also know that all these K points have as a third component zero, because we have only one K point, one point in the C direction and do not shift it. So this is always zero there. Okay. So this is how plane waves, your, um, your um, basis set and so on is linked to also to K points and, uh, and to, to this, okay? So now what happens if you have a system which is not periodic? Well, in this case, one is introducing a, a, a supercell. So the supercell, in fact, one is, I show you here, one is simply taking a cell which again is repeated periodically. This is also of today's exercises where you will calculate benzene. So one is putting your non-periodic system, sorry, an isolate molecule in a cell which is so large that the distance to the neighbors in one direction or in the other direction and on, on, also in the third direction is so long that you effectively cut off any overlaps of wave functions and so on. Okay? So a supercell essentially in these cases means that you're taking a very, the, as large as you can afford um, computational cell in order to ensure no interaction between these images. Now, this is not always so easily possible because if your object is charged, for example, if this molecule was charged, then you can use as large as you want a, a unit cell, the Coulomb interaction will always be, be there. The same if you have a molecule with a dipole or something with a dipole, it will interact with the dipolar interaction. You cannot have a cell which is so large that, uh, that this interaction goes completely away. Now, this, issue so for charged or dipole system has two solutions if you have a zero d so say a molecule or a cluster something which really is not periodic in no direction then you can use the input variable assume isolated which essentially in one way or the other cuts off coulomb interactions beneath the length which are intra um, intramolecular so the coulomb interaction will be cut such that essentially one molecule cannot see the other and therefore you are getting rid of this wrong periodicity which you might not want. So this is possible if you have zero D, so no periodicity at all. Things are more complicated if you have 
say something like a graphene layer or surface. So these are systems which are periodic in two dimensions, but which are not periodic in the third dimension. In this case, one is also using supercells, which have a lot of vacuum in the direction where the system is not periodic. But still, if your surface is charged or if you have dipoles along the surface, then uh, one surface will see the other. And in this case, oh sorry, in this case, you will have to be very careful and there again, look at the input description for the very um, deep field. You will have to put in some something into the vacuum to effectively decouple one surface, one image from the next. So in quantum espresso, you can calculate um, also non-periodic system, but always with these periodic codes, but you have to be careful in many cases. So I would like to use the last minutes, which I have, to say something about the other big issue, which are pseudopotentials. So why do we need pseudopotentials or what are pseudopotentials? So you remember in my very first slides where I've shown the Kuhn-Sham potential, there was the so-called external potential. And the external potential, as I've said, is the potential due to the nuclei. So it is a very easy shape. It is simply minus one over the distance from this nuclear nucleus times the nuclear charge, because it's simply a positive charge point-wise, which is attracting all the electrons. So that would be the, the pure Coulomb potential. Now, he, um, <clears throat> why are we not using the pure Coulomb potential? Well, the, the answer is, look at this here. If you're here on the left side of my graph, you have the nucleus, and this here, is the radial part of some atomic wave function. This might be, uh, I don't know, um, um, uh, 4S or so, I don't know, I have to count the notes here, um, wave function of your system. Then you see that close to the nucleus, this function, in fact, because say the 4S needs to be orthogonal to the 3S, needs to be orthogonal to the 2S, which needs to be orthogonal to the 1S, okay? So because of orthogonality, these radial functions, they have, very fast oscillations, but these oscillations are in a region of, of distance from the nucleus where anyway no chemistry is taking place, where no bonds with their neighbors are happening. The bonds with the neighboring atoms will probably happen in this region where you see the, your um, radial wave function is perfectly smooth. So um, this is a problem for us because as I've been explaining in length before, when we use plane wave basis sets, we define a minimal wavelength, lambda min, um, up to which we can describe features. So if we want to describe features which are as fine as what you see here in this um, radial wave function, you need a very small lambda min, and at the same time, therefore, a very high um, kinetic energy cutoff. And this is something which you really do not want because their calculation would become extremely expensive and in most interesting system undoable. And you would have to pay this high price for something you're not interested in because the shape of this wave function close to its nucleus is for most applications entirely irrelevant. So the idea of a pseudo potential is the following, is we try to replace the Coulomb potential, the one over R potential due to the nucleus, by something else, which has as a solution, a radial function, which looks here exactly like the right atomic all electron wave function for distances for um, further than some cutoff distance. Okay? And inside this cutoff sphere around the nucleus, where anyway, no bonding is supposed to happening, no chemistry is supposed to happening, you would like, to the function to be perfectly smooth and go smoothly to zero. So it's clear that obviously this blue function here would need a much lower kinetic energy cutoff, a much um, um, higher lambda min would be enough to describe this function with respect to this, uh, the, the red function here. So a lot of kind of research has been happened how one can create effectively such functions. And the most important lesson which people have learned is that this can only work if you have norm conservation. Norm conservation means that the integral inside this um, um, cutoff sphere around your atom, 
the integral of the norm of the all electron wave function must be the same as the integral um, of the, the blue pseudo wave function. This must be the case. Otherwise, your atom will have wrong scattering probable, um, um, properties and things will not work. So one thing which people have learned, they must construct the blue line in such a way that there is norm conservation. But apart from this, this can perfectly well be done. And I show you here how such a pseudo potential can look like here. This is for molybdenum, a pseudo potential. What you see here is the dashed line. This is the simple external Coulomb potential, which we would have without pseudo potential. So it's the function which goes to minus infinity, minus one over R, you see here. The pseudo potential, you see, has compared to this easy form, some very weird forms. You see here, far from the atom, it is the one over R of the exact one. But then as you come closer within this radius, the shape is quite strange. And you see also that it is angular momentum dependent which potential. So the pseudo potential is a potential which electrons of various angular momenta C and it has this shape. Far away from the atom, it is the same as the Coulomb potential. Close to the atom, it has an L dependent shape. And how is this obtained? Well, essentially, one calculates DFT for an atom and one is inverting the Schrödinger equation to find out which potential do I need to put in in order to have as a solution the blue line instead of the red line. Okay, so um, this is how a pseudo potential looks like. And in quantum espresso, when you run it, the, the pseudo potentials, you have to provide them as a user in the form of files. Okay? These are files, and the, these files contain numbers on a radial grid and tell you precisely the shape of these functions here, the, the, the solid lines on a radial grid for every element, a different one. Okay, so here, for example, this is an example for some, some system which I've been calculating. It has five different elements. In the input line, one says for every element, well, what is the mass of the element? And then one says, which is the name of the file which you want to use for this? And if you look at these file names, you can already see that um, since the pseudo potentials have to be calculated by inverting a Schrödinger equation of a DFT calculation on an atom, you need DFT to calculate a pseudo potential. So therefore the pseudo potentials depend on the functional. And so in a normal um, PW calculation or in a normal quantum espresso calculation, you will not need to put into your input which functional you want to use because the code automatically looks, ah, I have this pseudo potential, so I need to use the functional used for this one. In this case was the PBE functional, okay? So now as a user, you must be careful that if you have various elements in your system, like here, you must use only pseudo potentials, which are all being created with the same functional. Otherwise the system on your composite system, it would not know the code, which functional to use. Here, the density functional it will be using is obviously PBE. So be very careful and know what you are doing. If in the input file you say, I want to use, I don't know, uh, the HSE functional, but I have pseudo potentials which come from a different function. You can force the code to do this. If you do not force it, it will not like to do this and you will complain. Huh? So you should know what to do and keep in mind that pseudo potentials which you are using are um, functional dependent and um, so on. So this is the basic idea of uh, pseudo potentials. And I would like to finish what I have to say by pointing to two different classes of pseudo potentials, which are very important these days, which are so-called ultra soft pseudo potentials and poor pseudo potentials. Now, this is something which goes beyond what I've just said, what norm conservation is. Remember norm conservation means that in close to the atom, the integral of the square of the all electron wave function must be the same as the square of the pseudo wave function. Now, however, in many elements, this is a serious problem. For example, look here, this is oxygen, okay? And oxygen here, the all electron wave function looks like this, and there is not much wiggles or something you can get rid of. You will have your, your pseudo wave function if you use, um, um, a norm conserving pseudo potential will have to describe this very, uh, this peak here of the 2p wave function of oxygen 
and it will require a rather high cutoff, which I would like to avoid. Same problem appears if you have, for example, 3D transition metal or 4F uh, raw earth um, um, elements in your system, where you have no wiggles and nodes of your wave function, which allow you an efficient um, pseudization, like in the picture before, but where still you have something which is very localized and you would like to get rid of this very small wavelength, which you need here. So this norm conservation constraint is a problem in many kinds of systems. And uh, the way to go beyond this has been invented by David Vanderbilt uh, now many years ago. And essentially in this Vanderbilt ultras of pseudopotentials, the idea is to release this need of norm conservation, which I've mentioned before. Okay? So a norm conserving um, pseudopotential would require you to have, an all elect uh, um, to have a pseudo wave function, which more or less follows the all electron wave function with these very steep features here. What Vanderbilt has allowed is that your pseudo wave function looks like the dashed line here, so much smoother. In this case, this is again oxygen 2p, much smoother than this one here. But it's also clear that this here has a different norm inside the radius than this function here. So he had to get rid of norm conservation to do this. Now, how can he do it that without norm conservation, he still gets excellent results for the pseudo potentials? Well, the price which one has to pay here is that the one gets a more complicated expression for the charge density. Okay? So, so far, what we've always said is that the charge density is the sum over the square moduli of your Kuhn-Sharm orbitals. However, if you have um, ultrasoft, and the same story is true for poor pseudopotentials, which are for, for many users' points of view, exactly the same thing. So in ultrasoft or poor pseudopotentials, the density is defined as it was before, but then there is also an additional term here, um, um, which is called the augmentation charge density, which is always localized close to the atoms, to those atoms which have an ultrasoft pseudopotentials, and which needs a very high cutoff because this augmentation charge here will have to um, account for the difference between the square modulus of the dashed line and of the real line. Okay. So one obtains, uh, I will not give you here the expression because it contains a lot of projectors. It's not, not something easy to or, or pleasant to look at the expression for the augmentation charge. Just keep in mind that whenever you have a pseudo potential in your system, which is ultra soft or norm conserving, the code will add something to your charge density. And as the code adds something which will be very localized to your charge density, this means that the um, four times cutoff which you use for, um, for norm conserving pseudopotential will not be enough. You will need a much higher cutoff than this. So if I go back to this input, which I've shown you before, here in this system, okay, there are five elements. And if you look at the final names of these pseudopotentials, where well, we have already discussed, it says you PBE. But the file name here also in all cases has this US. Whenever you see US in the file name, and you can also look inside the file where it's written explicitly, these are US pseudopotentials. So beware that you need to have higher cutoff than four times the, the wave function cutoff. And, um, and uh, this is where it comes from. It comes from augmentation charges, which have to account for the difference here close to every atom. But this thing works very well. So here, for example, this is from this old Vanderbilt paper. He has shown here as a function of the cutoff energy, how the energy converges. And you see if you have a norm conserving, but then the conversion is very, very slow and you need to have very high cutoffs with these um, uh, ultra soft pseudo potentials already here in this case, a 30, 40 Rydberg, you have perfectly converged total energies for the wave function. So these pseudo potentials, either poor or um, ultra soft pseudo potentials, allow you to get away with a rather low cutoff for the wave functions, but beware the density will still need the high cutoff. Okay, this I've written here again explicitly. You need more than four times the cutoff for the orbitals. And uh, here, really, I have so many years of experience with new students and people doing quantum is present, I can tell you the most, uh, uh, the, the beginner's mistake I've seen most in all those years is that 
people do not realize that some pseudo potential is ultra soft or poor and do not specify the second cutoff. So in a typical input file, which you see, see here on the right, ECA WFC 40, this is for the uh, cone charm orbitals, the cutoff. If you have also um, some of these pseudo potential as shown to the left, you have to define another cutoff for the, the density. It is more in this times more than four times um, 40. A typical thing is either eight or 10 is a typical factor. So if you want a rule of thumb, but in truth is you must check convergence not with one cutoff, but with two cutoffs in your group. Okay. So with these words about uh, the most, most common beginner's mistake, um, all that remains to me is to wish you happy computing in these uh, in the tutorials, which will start now. And uh, if some of you have questions, I'm obviously very happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ralph. I don't know how the local organizers thought we should proceed. I would gladly there are, the, into there the are, background. Uh, there are four questions on the chat. I don't know, Ralph, if you can uh, read through them. Uh, wait, I can uh, because I'm having full screen of my presentation. Let me see. Besides, I just by chance now see that it's ten zero zero zero. So this is a perfectly timed talk. Huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I cannot see. Uh, wait. Why can I not see the question? One. Yeah, the first uh, one. Even is why don't you read can, can you read it to me? Because I cannot see it here now. Yeah, so one is uh, what are the pro and cons, the pro and constraint of that uh, 0.5 shifting? I believe uh, this is about the. Uh, ah, the, the K point. Uh, yes, exactly. K point yeah, yeah. the brilliant zone. So, yeah, so then, the, sorry, there is another one saying uh, the same question uh, what do I need to shift uh, the K mesh? Okay, so yeah, let me say something more about the K point. Uh, can you still see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, good. So um, this is very much related to symmetries of K points. Obviously the code tries to calculate as little as somehow possible. And it is employing the symmetries of your system to reduce the number of K points, okay? So if you have like you have here, for example, um, uh, um, um, a four by four by uh, by four grid, okay? Then some of these K points are equivalent, okay? Due to your symmetry. So for example, you might imagine that you can here have a symmetry um, for the plus uh, minus X plus minus Y and uh, concentrate only on the irreducible wedge of this, of this rectangle here, okay? Then the code will automatically calculate only one of the various equivalent K points um, and give that K point a higher weight. Okay. Now, if you have a shift of your um, regular mesh, then typically the points lie on less symmetric points in the brilliant zone, meaning that the symmetries allow you a higher multiplicity of your points. So it is all due to, in fact, due to symmetry. So the big advantage is, is you have with less calculations, you have more sample points because the K points lie on less symmetric points. You can see this, I mean, as I said before, the key thing of a not shifted mesh is, mesh is that the K equals zero is always in the non-shifted mesh. And the K equals zero, whatever is the symmetry you're doing lands on itself. So that point counts only for itself. If you shift it a little bit to a, some, a point which is not symmetric lying out of um, the center, then every symmetry will bring this point on a different point, and therefore you, you obtain effectively more K points with the same calculation. So the advantage of shifting is that you have a faster convergence of your K point sampling if your grid is shifted. The disadvantage, and there are disadvantages, is that sometimes you want to compare a calculation with K points with a different calculation with less K points, but a larger unit cell. Okay. So you can, for example, take a supercell where you double the dimension of your, your primitive cell in all directions. And then in order to have an equivalent calculation, you should have exactly half the number of K points. Okay. And this equivalence of, of a supercell with a, a shifted mesh um, goes away. For, because for this equivalence, you always need, again, the K equals zero point and the regular mesh in your system. 
But these are really very special cases where you need for some reasons to compare either a super cell with a K-point calculation cell, or um, it can happen that if you want to calculate some electron phonon properties, you need particular, a particular regular mesh where it cannot be shifted. So in special applications, it can happen that shifting is not good. If your goal is really only in a periodic system to converge as fast as possible with as few K points as possible, you should always shift. Other questions? Yeah, there are, there are some others. So how far can we set the distance between supercell in case of not periodic system to neglect the interactions? Uh, so there are no rules of thumb. Some people say, ah, oh, seven angstrom is always enough. Some other people will say in seven angstrom, it's clearly uh, too close and it must always be 11 or so. This is something where you typically have to do a convergence test. So you calculate it with various, with the say eight, nine, 10 angstrom difference between your copies. And then you see, it depends very much on the system, as I've said, if there are, if there are dipoles, if they are, the system is somehow charged, then you will need much more vacuum than uh, in cases where everything is neutral. Very good. I understood that it is often give, uh, gives much faster convergence uh, as there will be more equivalent K points. Is this right? Maybe this is a question related yeah, yeah, to exactly. This is what I just said. It converges faster. Yeah, another one is cutoff always 10 times. If we increase 100 times, then is it effective? <laughs> it's certainly not effective because if you have 100 times, uh, so I mean, you probably think about the ratio between the cutoff for density and uh, wave function, I imagine. And uh, so at a certain point, using a higher cutoff for the density will make a calculation heavier, but you will be at convergence. So a typical thing nearly always in, uh, you get away with the effect of eight between um, uh, the density and the wave function um, cutoffs. In fact, uh, the people um, in Lausanne with Nicola Mazzari, they've made a very thorough testing of uh, cutoffs for all kinds of pseudopotentials. And with the pseudopotentials, they recommend in their database, these, uh, um, they get for all elements except iron, they get optimal results with a factor of eight between the two cutoffs. Only iron, they needed 10. But that is specific to those pseudopotentials they recommend. Okay, there is the, la the latest uh, question from the Zoom and then we switch, uh, there are a few questions from the streaming as well. Mm -hmm. So the latest from the Zoom is beside of the Eiger cutoff for the density, is there any disadvantage to use the ultra soft pseudos? Um, the disadvantage, it depends. One, for me personally, the biggest disadvantage of ultra soft pseudo potential is that some advanced features might not be implemented. Um, for example, I recently was interested in some electron phonon interaction, some systems, and that was not yet implemented for Bohr or um, Ultrasoft. But generally today, nearly always people use Bohr or Ultrasoft pseudo potential, simply because one can get away with much less computational effort. Okay. There are, there are... And let me just say, so yes. then the, the issue arises mainly if one uh, uses hybrid functions where one needs to calculate exact exchange, that is still an issue where I think we should all work more on implementing that with ultra soft pseudo potentials in a, in a better and even faster way than it is now. Okay, there are a few questions from the streaming. So yeah. um, even with periodicity, what is the reason of band bending as we go to higher dimension supercells? What does this mean, band bending? Uh, I don't understand this question. So. Typically, when you have an interface between two different kinds of materials, you have a band bending, yes. But I don't see how this is linked to, to periodicity in higher dimensions. Okay, let's go, um, let's go to the other one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, how, how to create an uh, ion in quantum espresso so that the ion absorption on the surface can be studied? Ah, so no, what you can do is you can create an ionic system by telling in the input file that you want to have a charged system. So you can say, I want to have one more or one or two, three electrons more or less than it's neutral. So your system will therefore be charged. Then it is quantum mechanics, which decides where the system prefers to take away the electron. If uh, you have, for example, a, a, an atom on top of a surface and you take away an electron, 
that this electron will prefer going away from the at atom or from the surface. This is quantum mechanics, which decides where it goes away. This is not something which you as a user sh can and should, should, uh, should change. Okay, so you can in the input file simply say, I want more or less electrons in my system, but where in space these electrons decide to localize, this is physics which decides. Uh, which pseudo potential is recommended for computational expensive form calculation? Maybe this is something is going to be answered during the school, I think. Yeah, I think it will be seen during the school. Let me just say for pseudo potentials, I reasonably like very much this uh, pseudo potential table, which uh, has been tested. I just said it before in, in Lausanne. Uh, it's the SSSP pseudo potentials. So if you type in Google SSSP pseudo potentials, you'll find a table, a periodic table, it says only for the functions PBE and PBE sol, but it gives you recommended cutoffs, everything, and they are very thoroughly tested. And I mean, there are many other libraries for pseudo potentials. Recently, I've made good experience with those. Okay, the last from the from the online. Um, is there a way to predict how many K points will an output file process given a certain mesh? For example, how many K points will a six times six times one mesh? have, please ah, this, assume no uh, symmetry. This de it depends on the symmetry of your system. <laughs> so in principle, if you're six times six times six, it's the number of K points is that, you multiply that. But it then, is, uh, please luckily assume, the code sorry, finds say, out that, uh, sorry? Sorry, I have the question and with please assume no symmetry. Uh, if you assume no symmetry, then if you have a three by three by three grid, you will have 27 uh, K points. But okay, there are a few big questions from the from the Zoom, the last two big. I don't know if you can read the, the, and yourself because it's quite long. Or otherwise, I, I go through it. So one is, uh, as one can understand, that a large number of failure can come from incorrect use of pseudo potential, grid choice resolution, etc. Oh, In yes. this regard, it will be great if everyone who use quantum espresso took his as a rule at the end of their scientific work, say, at the stage of making an article available on the internet to place their input script to an open library. What do you see? Uh, Maybe uh, this is in progress. So this is a very big topic, not only for pseudo potential. This goes into this big discussions which are taking place these days about open science, okay? So in principle, the good thing, the good practice should be for everyone, and especially for those who enter the field now, um, when you publish something, it should be done in such a way that anyone can repeat your calculations, okay? So that is in principle the goal which one should have. Science should be reproducible and you should have uh, either on some GitHub or, or some other um, repository, some way where people find all the data they need, not only pseudo potentials, but as you say, also input files and so on to reproduce the calculations. So this is where the world is going, I think, and where it should be going, and editors should exist, uh, insist more on that this is being done. Having said this, many people do not want to do it because uh, if you give away your input files, everyone can do your calculations and people for the wrong reasons, I think, they want to keep thinking, only I know how to calculate a graphene, surface, a graphene sheet and I do not want that others also can do it easily. And uh, so, some people especially, uh, yeah, okay. So some people are picky about giving away input files, which I think is the wrong attitude. Okay, so I suggest that there is only one last question from the uh, streaming and then the Zoom and maybe we reply here in chat. I mean, we're always able to reply here and then Ralph will be available also in some breakout room, I believe at some point during the school. So the last one I take from the streaming is, uh, uh, is possible to change the electronic configuration of the cell potential of the atoms for droplet system? Well, so, so first I should say the idea of pseudo potentials is that they should be transferable. Meaning that if you have a, a pseudo potential say for carbon, then you should be able to use this very same pseudo potential. If you are in uh, graphene, if you're in diamond, if you're at high pressure, if you have an atom, in whatever chemical environment this carbon atom is, you should be able to use the same pseudo potentials. They are made for this. Okay? So this is point number one, transferability. However, if you think you are in such a um, special case that you need, because I don't know, the electronic environment is so strange, you need to construct um, new pseudo potentials starting from different electronic calculations, you are free to do so. And as I said in the beginning, there is the atomic code distributed with quantum espresso in which you define 
the uh, electronic configuration of the atoms upon which you construct your pseudo potential. You can do it, but especially for beginners, I do not at all recommend starting to create your own pseudo potentials. This is a source of the most serious kind of errors which can appear. There are very good pseudo potentials ready for downloading everywhere. Okay, I will uh, think we can close it here for now. Uh, take a break of 10 minutes before we, 15 minutes before we have the end of session. So thank you very much, Ralph. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this great talk. And uh, hey,